thank you for inviting me to this class. It's a two-part lecture series, but it's really not a lecture, it's a conversation. But what I want to do is share with you my fascination about the discipline and why it is such a fundamental change in the academia and the workplace has come together where something is released in science like a week ago and it already is finding practical impact. In fact, it has been less than 24 hours since the new large scale learning model was released. You already see people putting that to use. And so the distance from knowledge creation to putting knowledge to work and then advancing knowledge is dramatically reduced to the point where it actually doesn't exist. And knowledge creation is happening in multiple places, which means the entrepreneurship has taken a totally new dimension. And I hope by the time I can I close this conversation, you will see how data-driven innovation actually is a core part of entrepreneurship going forward. So let me just first say a few words about why, what is about data? We learn our word from observations from childhood to now. We know about the word based on what we see here or indirectly through reading and other people's experience. So data is a core part of, of who we are. Observations are data and they have been with us for a very long time. So when we say data science, data driven, it fundamentally opens a question, what has changed? And why are we even talking about something that is as basic as learning to, to walk and see and recognize things from childhood? Let me just share you a few screens with you as to what I see on my own cell phone. You know, my friends who are active in some social groups, we be no application where we share our love of wines, which if we tried a new wine somewhere, or energy use on a daily basis in my Home, for example, how much energy is being produced by solar panel or over the last year or the year before, for example. If I go a bit more personal, almost every application I have on my machine has something that is measuring. For example, my runs, different runs as to what in each of those runs, how much shock my knees took, how much a pronation my feet had and so on. These are being measured right now with sensors that are already embedded either in my socks or in my shoes or in some other device or in your watch. And these are all new. These are less than 10 to 15 years old. Not only that, if you look at the businesses, and this slide is actually a little bit older, but even then, the companies that have come together in the areas of infrastructure for data management, or data analysis, or various applications, or just making data itself available, that area just keeps growing. I don't need to tell you that now, if you look at the most valuable corporation, you know, top of valuable corporations, they have all related something to do with information and how we put that information to use. So there is definitely few changes that are a fruit, and I want to sort of relate that to you. One is that the infrastructure of the society is changing. Uh, it's starting with IT infrastructure, but then infrastructure for electricity, transportation, healthcare, all the lifelines are beginning to be changed. There are new platforms emerging, and this notion of platform, I want to now walk you through a few of them. And, and that has led to a few opportunities which are almost immediate, as well as some long-term. So you are familiar with the IT infrastructure, for example, you know, about clouds, or at least you've heard about clouds, where which basically you can think of it as somebody else's larger scale computer, but it's really a bit more than that. It is a computational resource that is available almost universally on demand. And it is possible because there are devices that are connected at the end of it, whether it is a you know, IoT device or your cell phone or your temperature sensor, whatever else, you know, your fever sensors, and all of these are now have come with an IP address and they're connected to the cloud. In between, of course, you have large scale of networks called the internet. So if you look at this, just this infrastructure, this infrastructure itself has become a platform itself for what we call perception, cognition, action loops. In other words, you sense something, you recognize something from that, 
and then you take action on that. Let me give you examples of such loops that are already emerging. And again, there are multiple different application domains. For example, your car. The automated driving has benefited significantly from other cars, which are also connected to the same cloud network. And their experience of driving is actually some part of learning of your car. So this is, again, you have radars that are pursuing the road. There are GPS that are localizing it, understanding the scene, and they're acting in real time, for example. But that's not the only one. Drones are there. Applications is smart buildings and an area in which I work quite a bit, where the buildings themselves are like a, a giant platform for new types of programs and infrastructure. The same thing with electrical grid, water grid, and so on. So we can keep going on to these perception, cognition, action loops, and they're basically made possible because they are connected to the internet where massive parallelization can happen. For example, you already benefit from your grammar or text correction because it benefits from every other text that is on the web. So this massive scale parallelization has led us to two fundamental changes. One is the ubiquity and scale of data. It's not the same as what we used to think about knowledge, even though fundamentally architecture it might be the same. And second thing is development of sophisticated analytic tools. Now, I would not go into the tools too much simply because that requires a technical domain knowledge, but I'll give you the input-output relationships as to how all these tools are happening. But the data is beginning to be used in ways that was previously not imagined at all. You used to take your blood pressure once you went to the clinic and they took that. It could not be a time series with something that you could be taking you know multiple times during the day even without even realizing because there are indirect sensing methods to do that and your doctor can actually put that information to use so it's a data rich society we live in it's a society in which we of course are familiar with the social networks but not only that microbiome for example that's a data rich area climate modeling or if you look at localization of cities or your genomic data. In all of these cases, we are now beginning to see and ask questions. Can we do this? Can we do that? For example, I'll come to human health. Can we detect patterns from symptoms? Isn't that what doctors do? That's what their experience is about. Well, the question is, then what are the data here now? You have lots of notes by physicians or clinicians in different formats. Data is complex with different sets of data sets, which may, may be complete, incomplete. The outliers, which might be there, may actually be the most important part of the data. You know, the, the sudden spike in some biomarker, for example, that happened, it was an explainable reason and so on. Second thing, the multiple challenges we run into when we look at disease diagnosis, for example, we might know the input data, but we don't know what does that mean because that requires a domain knowledge. It's not labeled, like unlike a picture of a cat or a dog, which is labeled, or somebody could look at it and label, oh yeah, this is this. And a picture of cat does not change a picture of a dog based on some input data changes, for example. Then the relationships are non-linear. In other words, a set of observations does not incrementally result into, into a conclusion that was built upon a previous conclusion and it was a modification of that. And models can be very complex and so on. So people have said, well, can we do crowdsourcing, for example, like recommender systems? And here we have networks coming up where people sort of share information based on their experiences of, of particular drugs or particular treatment and so on. But again, massive variability. And that is why there is still within a regulatory regime, not evidence that it actually works in a reliable way. So any early attempts in this area have not actually succeeded. You know, whether it's Thomas, is Watson, for example, from IBM and others. But there is a thesis behind it that we are at this beginning threshold of trying to understand data that can be put to use in various applications. So then what are the applications where it actually works? Well, there are three kinds of applications where it works. You can start to see where data-driven is becomes useful. The word, first one is detecting patterns. Detective patterns is if I give you a sequence of numbers, if I give you a sequence of alphabets, if I give you a sequence of characters, if I give you a sequence of genome data, 
And is there a repetitive patterns? Is how complex that repetitive pattern is? Obvious repetitive patterns, you can look at it and say that. The algorithms have become sophisticated enough that if there exists a pattern in data, it will be detected. It can be detected. And that is basically behind all the speech recognition or the image recognition advances. You give me an image and you look at a Google image and you can, or you know, Facebook image and you can do it. Information about it will tell you there are two people standing here or there is a tree here and so on. Each of these is a pattern, whether it's a pattern, a two dimensional grid or a three dimensional grid or an n dimensional grid, doesn't matter. But the advances in pattern detection were the one of the earliest ones. And that is started, you know, about seven, eight years ago with handwriting detection. And then from there, it basically took off. And the next generation of excitement in this AI and machine learning began. In all of those patterns in the past, uh, we had an idea that this is what it means. For example, if you wrote an A by handwriting, we also knew that it was an A, so we could put a label A on it. So we started getting all this labeled data, especially through the internet, and that allowed us to sort of train our machines and detect these patterns very easily. The much of the advances since then have been in the areas where you can detect patterns even if the data is incomplete. You can also detect data where the data may be incomplete both in time or space, and you can even fill in the data. It's called the so-called imputation problem. So largely solved problem in many domains, which continues to yield very surprising results, improved agriculture, improved resources, and so on. For example, even coding, correcting Programming errors, for example, many tools have been returned with sort of identify the, the error patterns. After all, these are done by humans and, and automatically can do patch fixes. So recognizing patterns into multiple areas, coding errors and programming and, and so on, and then even synthesizing. It can, turns out that this recognition pattern can be put into a feedback loop where you can actually provide some input or some labels that can generate data. So the so-called generative adversarial networks or GANs and their derivatives have started to give you synthesized realities. So you might have seen deep fakes and so on, which are actually my pattern detection in reverse. The research in this area has moved on to understanding why it works and when it works and when it does not work. In other words, from observations, now building the mathematical tools and, and that can allow us to generalize our results and, and so on. And that's really a pretty mature area. So that's the pattern detection. The second area, which is now beginning to be put into use is automation. And again, automation is not the PAC loop, perception uh, PCA loop, piece of perception cognition action loop I, I told you about. And here you have a much higher safety requirement, for example, let me see. And trustworthiness simply because they might be in critical conditions and safety conditions and so on. And, and this is where we are beginning to combine the pattern detection methods with the physical reality method, the so-called symbolic models. And so and your symbolic methods are beginning to come to use. And the lastly, there is inference and cognition. This is the hardest problem, which is where we are beginning to see, for example, can I predict who is be a good person to recruit based on reading resumes and so on. These, these are much, much harder problems. In fact, in fact, it brings us closer to whether there is a notion of an artificial general intelligence. The only thing I'll mention here is that there is some excitement in large language models that are beginning to happen, where after the years of disappointment in human biases, we're beginning to now create systems that actually have a memory of questioning before and answers. They can recall them. They can also detect when they should not answer a question or when they should, or when they cannot answer it. Going forward, I think there are some lessons that, that we are beginning to learn. One is that 
more data is not always most useful. And so now going from data to quality data is again a growth area. Algorithmic choices are the same way. The more choices an algorithm has, the more likely it is going to be making a wrong choice. So how do you actually create some kind of a Pareto optimality of choices? There's a whole new science is emerging in this area. And that science is what we call data science. Now it turns out that, that because the experimentation is an integral part of it, but the experimentation here requires applications in human in the loop, it basically goes through experimentations of the kind that entrepreneurs are very used to. Let me just summarize everything by the last slide. The data science really is about connecting the dots. In my next talk, I'll talk to you about what it means to do data science internally. But it, it really allows us to create new knowledge, whether the new knowledge is understanding or changing some things or re directing experiments, making inferences. Hopefully it will improve the quality of life and protect the environment around us. So what I'm gonna do now is to step back a little bit and just examine this notion of connecting the dots and how that emerges into a discipline. But before we get there, I just wanted to step back a little bit into just the science itself. So that if you know the word, you know, if you were to put that in perspective, it's easier to understand where data science is coming in. So I'm gonna first show you a picture. This is Milutin Milankovic. He looks pretty young. He was a Serbian civil engineer, trained in Vienna. He built bridges and structures and patented a new type of reinforcement concrete. He had recently married in June 1914. These dates are important. And you would know, being a Serbian in Austria around July 1914, where he was with his honeymoon, wasn't a good thing. That were the set of incidents that happened in July that led to World War One, And so he was actually as a Serbian, you know, and he was sent to Budapest under home arrest with a provision, and his wife fought very hard and got a provision. He's just an engineer, nothing to do with war and so on. And so house arrest, but he could go to the library of Hungarian Academy of Sciences and spend some time there. So here you are, Malyatin Milankovic, trained as a structural engineer, and you have time to kill. You're sitting in the library. And what do you do? Now, in those days, there was a debate raging in the scientific community about the age of the Earth. The estimates range from 6,000 years to a few million years. And there were geologists like Louis Agassi who found the evidence that there was you know, glaciers in southern France. You see this big rock, for example, in the middle of a steppe, and you ask the question, how did it get there? It got there because it was under what point time it was covered in ice. So they sort of uh, had this picture that now this place was covered with ice at some point and the ice melted. But what made the ice melt? And uh, people had all kinds of theories and there was a janitor actually at uh, in a Scottish University, James Crawl, who put forward a theory in a paper in Philosophical Quarterly in 1860, who said, you know, the climate changes because Earth's orbit around the sun wobbles and changes. And that wobbling, eccentricity, what they call it, causes the, uh, the you know, climates to come and go. And he said, well, the last uh, ice age was about 80,000 years ago. Now, imagine if it, ice age was 80,000 years ago, Earth is older than that. And so, and so then there were astronomers who started studying that subject as well. And the astronomers were basically collecting metrology data uh, and and so there was lots of lots of this metrology data, which was just numerical data collected over the years. And but there was not a whole lot of explanation as to how this weather actually worked. And so when Milankovic looked at this data, he basically said most of the metrology is nothing but collection of innumerable empirical findings, mainly numerical data. You can say the same thing about our healthcare data today, by the way. <laughs> with traces of physics used to explain some of them. And mathematics had no role to play, maybe some addition and multiplication, as I said, there was no mathematics that was applied to it. So he took this data in four years of this home confinement, 
he basically tried to make sense of planetary motions by actually calculating <laughs> through a ruler, a slide ruler, the in amount of solar radiation falling on each latitude of the Earth for a long period of time, over 650,000 years, by the way. And he published that into a volume called Contribution of Mathematical Theory of Climate. And and it took him quite a bit of time, 1924, he wrote the book, turns the hundreds and thousands of pages of this handwritten numerical data, numerical uh, data into a model like this, where, you know, it sort of has the earth and the sun, and you have the earth that is moving around it. You have a bunch of the orbit itself changes, eccentricity, you have the precession that causes it. And that basically causes the weather changes. And now it will take another 40, 50 years before the evidence actually emerged from, from uh, I say, from basically the amount of uh, oxygen in the shells in the, the seafloor. But basically the evidence was found that you have these cycles over the years that overall lead to glaciation together. And these are the ice ages. So this was uh, published in, uh, so this was discovered early in 1949, but this is a more recent article on that. So what you see is a bunch of observations that became useful because it was cast into a mathematical framework in which you can apply some Newtonian calculus and so on, okay? That allowed you to explain and predict what the behavior would be, for example, weather. And, and this has been the story in last 100, 150 years, that the mathematics that we learned, Newtonian calculus and going forward and so on, was so fit to understand, explain our physical world that we don't even need to build everything. For example, if a car hits another car at a certain velocity, how much will the impact be? You don't need to simulate that. You can actually calculate it. And so, you know, even there are high school problems that you sort of solve with that because of the mathematics that goes with it. So the if mathematics is extraordinarily effective in explaining our physical world today. Now, today, when we look at the data, it is a universal solvent. Everything you observe can be converted into bits and bytes, whether it is pressure, temperature, movement, gait, acceleration, and so on. It's nothing but, but a bunch of numerical data. So now you have like a data is a universal solvent. The challenge we have is the mathematics of that is still evolving. But even just the raw data is so effective Then the article actually was referring to under universal effectiveness of data. But basically said that if you have the data such as specially labeled data, you can do language translation. You can, you know, you do that in Google Translate, for example, image recognition, you already know how effective that is. You can detect any pattern. I was telling you last time that if there exists a pattern in data, there are already methods that will detect it without fail. So you can learn from quite a bit. So the effectiveness of mathematics has translated into the effectiveness of data for the modern world. But the data now is no longer about the physical world. It's also about humans. It's about our society. It's about our democracy. So the data now represents a lot more things than the absurd things of nature and of phenomena. Some things that we observe in nature, we don't quite understand, but we are beginning to understand that is we often do experiments, whether it is proteomics, genomics, and whatever else, where we sort of look at the data and, and we try to find relations between input and output. That's called the hypothesis formation and in, uh, inferencing of the causality. But this is a growth idea right now in biology, for example, whether you look at a genomic data, you look at the proteomic data, mass spectrometry data, and so on, and then you start to connect them to human characteristics and disease, for example. That's not the only thing. At global scale, we are doing many other things. For example, a young faculty member in, in SDSI and in bioengineering, uh, Ben Smart, I, I, I reads the data from uh, these ring devices, uh, data related to temperature, heart rate, heart rate variability, and so on, and use that to predict onset of disease, for example. And it's pretty effective in that. Another faculty member we hired, uh, Krishna, uses neural networks to figure out how humans learn things, not machines, how, much, how humans learn things. And just to give another example, 
uh, Ilka Altintas runs a project called Wi-Fire at DSC, and it uses current weather data, dryness conditions, and so on to predict where the fire is started in the forest, for example, so that you can direct your firefighting equipment effectively to predict where the fires will be going. This is a massive project because it affects us very significantly. So practical things are beginning to happen already with respect to these data being put to use. So then that brings us to the next step. And in the next five minutes, I'll try to sort of give you an overview of what the discipline looks like. So the discipline of data science, when we talk about discipline now as a subject area, as a department, as a degree program and so on, then it becomes an academic question as to what is the community? Who are the people in this? What do they share? How do they know that this is a good result, but this is not so good? How do they know this is a useful result, for example? Today, that community is spread across electrical engineering, computer science, mathematics, statistics, computational social science, business, for example, and a very long tail of practitioners. And they have a number of publication venues and so on. So what do they share? Generally, we talk about a community shares something when they know some topics together. For example, you pick up every computer scientist, they all know about NP completeness or computational complexity. You pick up any mathematician, they all know about basic calculus or geometry or something and so on. So similarly, electrical engineering, they know something about which is common to all of them. So, but then each of these communities also has their own methods of validating results and so on. And what will the success look like in data science? Now, here is how I see it. The community of data scientists is beginning to navigate between generalist view of the world and a specialist view of the world. A generalist view of the world looks for results that are insensitive to data, that are persistent. For example, your Newtonian laws or Maxwellian laws or invariances of nature, for example. So they're looking for similarly logical relationships. So for example, they are looking for methods and tools that sort of work across areas. On the other hand, a specialist looks for the data that is in the context of the practical application. And these two working together, and look, remember, I'm not saying theory and applied. I'm saying generalist and a specialist. And that's the big distinction between science and technology, theory and applied, because that happens in both places here. Let me give you examples of the challenges that the, the area is seeing. And, and these are, I've written it at the highest level so that without any math in it, but these are, you can call grand challenge problems of data science. For example, how do humans learn? How does, how does machines learn? I'll give you one example there. And why does sometimes it work so well for humans and sometimes machines, but not for always? Why humans have a hard time remembering few things or have a hard time understanding numbers at the same time, how machines can easily detect patterns than human cannot, for example. So just understanding learning, which means understanding cognition, maybe brain, maybe something combined with that. Uh, causal reasoning and control, how do we discover causal relationships and use that to create, for example, word in which our physical word is deeply coupled with our digital word. They are already beginning to be covered. Your presence, you know, somebody who is looking at your location through, let's say, a GPS and so on, and through remote platforms, let's say, the physical word, and maybe not your location, but location of, of a train, for example. How do we mine, mine knowledge from data? How do we characterize, extract, enhance value from data? How do we make sure that this data is outlier, but that outlier is actually useful? How do we fit and but not overfit data to our models? How do we navigate data from intentional or actual noise, including misinformation, for example? How do we engender trust in data and the artifacts that might have? And similarly, the last one, how do we architect new kind of systems which are accessible universally, whether physically or through new means, okay? So these are the challenges and conversation goes on. There is a whole community of people coming from either computational science or mathematics side who sort of define their own intense research challenges. So for example, here is an article by Janet Wing, which says 10 research challenges on data science. There's a computational view. And right after that is an article 
challenge opportunities in establishing data science, which are another 10 areas, very different areas. So if somebody were to ask me, what are the top challenges? I can't tell you the answer because it depends on which community you come from. Different communities, different perspectives, but there are some things which are common. Data is heterogeneous. Nobody argues that today. Fairness, accountability, ethics are important consideration. Then there are you know, questions are how this data is put to use. So I'll skip that there. But what we did in HDSI is we launched it in this one, 2018. So less than five years ago, four years ago, we launched the data science. Bill Nye came and was on the inaugural speaker, Peter Lee. He was Peter Lee said, he's VP of Microsoft Research. He said, perhaps there is no other scientific or intellectual endeavor today that is more important than advancement of data science. And we sort of defined it, data as DSI, data science, not just another silo like others, but we said, you know what, it will actually have inter engagements between different units. But, and this is like the hub and spoke, but it will also engender other connections. There are a few characteristics, the three main characteristics of data science at UCSD. One is that it takes a very unified view of data science across all areas, whether it's business or medicine or, or, or marine sciences. It's very student-centered. So I told you before even we put this DSI together, we created the programs for the students. And it's very much focused on experimentants. We have created a cluster of strength. I won't go into the details of the cluster of strength, but you can see the categories whether it's life sciences or scientific discovery or data science itself areas or the society, for example. Just to give you a last couple of slides on how we are, we are the data science measure itself. The data science system just has introduction to data science which sort of orients you towards asking the right question. And remember the domains are in parallel. It has theory, computer science, practical application data science, and then it has advanced topics. And these are the courses that you actually do. We actually cast them in some kind of you know, axis, as computer science, math, stat, and domain. And these are the actual flows, but that doesn't really matter. The more important part is that it connects, connects to domains, whether domains are natural sciences, social sciences, business, or econometrics, or, or of course, human behavior. All, I think if you look at it, data science is because there are new platforms and new methods. There are new tools, there are new insights, and all of that allow you to create new stack, new kinds of cognition and action loops. It's a very emerging discipline. So I just think of it as a combination of group of people who will define by the results what this field will emerge. Many, many challenges and areas that I've sort of talked about. So with all of that, thank you for your time. And I'm happy to answer any questions.